Hi there, everybody. Today we're going to look at section 9.1 and a little bit of section 9.2. Uh, so I'm just blending them together into one section. The homework also um, has parts of 9.2 in it. We don't do the second half of 9.2. If you're reading along with the ebook, there's two, there's two parts in 9.2. We only do the first part. All right, so let's jump right in and talk about differential equations. So we're going to start by looking at mathematical models. And for our purposes, a mathematical model of a real world problem is an equation or set of equations that approximates the solution. So modeling means a lot of things in math. But for us, you haven't seen much of this. So to introduce it, we're really just looking for equations or sets of equations. And the idea is that models are developed either through intuitive reasoning about the phenomenon or from a physical law based on evidence from experiments. And you'll see that as we go through uh, the section today, how that works. And many times a mathematical model takes the form of a differential equation. So it's just an unknown function and some of its derivatives. So there's a relationship between the function itself and some of, his, some of its derivatives. They interact somehow. And in real world situations, we often notice that changes occur and we want to predict future behavior based on how current values change. And, and we know lots of examples of that. So we're not going to spend a ton of time looking at examples in this section. This is just a quick pass um, through the world of differential equations uh, in this section. And we're also going to do section 9.3, which shows how to solve a certain type of differential equations. So we're just, it's not a full treatment of the topic. There's an entire class that many of you will take called differential equations that covers this in much more detail. So we're going to look at population growth. You've seen this stuff before, perhaps in a biology class or maybe in a college algebra class, but you don't know where the equation came from. You, you may be given an equation, but you don't know why that equation is what it is. So what we're going to do is we're going to look at, um, you know, what's the most basic population growth model. So the most basic way to model population growth is to assume the population grows at a rate proportional to the size of the population. In this model, we have two variables, time and population size. So the growth rate is the derivative dp uh, dt. Now, when we do differential equations in general, a lot of times t is the independent variable, but it doesn't have to be. Um, the derivative itself will tell you what the independent variable is, right? Whatever's in the denominator here, that's the independent variable. And whatever's in the numerator is the dependent variable. So if you're not sure, just look at how the derivative um, is formed, and it'll tell you uh, dependent, independent. Now, we already know that we want the population growth to be proportional to the population. So there's an interaction. Somehow the rate of change depends on the population itself. And this is how you would write it, right? So dp dt is some constant times the size of the population. So whenever you write it this way, it's assumed that p is a function of t. Even if you don't write it that way, you don't have to write p of t. You're allowed to, and sometimes you do a Sometimes you'll see it written that way, other times you won't. There has to be a dependent variable and there has to be an independent variable. Maybe later on you'll see that there could be more than one dependent variable, but there's always one independent variable um, until you take multivariable calculus. All right. So this is our differential equation, and we want to see if there's any results that form naturally from this. So one thing you want to notice is that the derivative is a constant multiple of the original function. And we only know one function where that happens, right? We can also see as long as p is not zero and k is positive, then the rate of change will be positive, right? Because if this is a positive number and this is a positive number, then the population will keep increasing. Now we can imagine that k could be negative 
Like the population could be decreasing. That's a thing that can happen. Right? And also, as P gets bigger, so as the population increases, the rate of change of the population increases. So if this doubles, then this doubles. All right? Because it's just a constant multiple. So we have to imagine what a solution might look like to a differential equation like this. Some of you might already know, maybe you've seen this before, uh, but the idea here is that the solution is a constant multiple of the original function. So we know that any constant times e to a constant times t will indeed have a derivative that's proportional to itself. So p of t is c e to the k t, so p prime of t so when we take the derivative, right, the k just comes in front. Then we switch the k and the c because order doesn't matter for multiplication. And we just have a constant multiple of the original function. So the derivative is a constant multiple of what we started with. That's what we want. So any exponential function of the form p of t equals c e to the kt is a solution. So what makes one solution different than another? That depends on the initial problem. So in the initial problem, you'll be given two pieces of information. You'll either be given the starting population or the growth rate or the constant K. You'll be given two of the three and have to find the other one. And that'll allow you to solve problems like this. So C might be allowed to vary for different um, types of problems. So C is just a constant, right? So if we let C vary, it just changes the slope, the derivatives, right? A constant multiple. So if we double C, it doubles the derivative, basically. So at time T equals zero, so that's the Y axis here, we have P of zero is C E to the K times zero, which is just C, right? Because E to the zero is one. So that means that the initial population is just this number C, whatever it happens to be. So that's one of the numbers you might be given in the problem. And when you look at the form of the solution, it kind of makes sense, right? The population at time T is the initial population times some sort of growth function. And that works fine, assuming um, you know, unlimited resources, no predators, things like that for a population. But we want to look at more realistic models and it has to reflect that environments have limited resources. So many populations start by increasing in an exponential manner, but the population levels off when it approaches its carrying capacity or decreases towards M if it ever exceeds M. So the, the carrying capacity is sort of the point at which the environment can no longer handle any more individuals, right? So if for some reason the population exceeds that number, it decreases. Uh, the derivative decreases and the population decreases, um, right? The derivative becomes negative, right? When, so when I say decreases, I mean it moves in the negative direction. Um, but if the population is less than the carrying capacity, it will still increase. So in order for our model to take into account both trends, it should satisfy both assumptions. The derivative is approximately equal to uh, Kp if P is small. So if the population is small, the carrying capacity really has no bearing on how fast the population increases. And the derivative is negative if the population is larger than the carrying capacity. So if we just institute these two assumptions, Let's see what happens to our population model. Right, we incorporate these new assumptions by assuming the rate of population growth is proportional to both the population and the difference between the carrying capacity and the population. So here I just put a lowercase c in here because it's a new function, so I didn't want to use capital C. So the derivative is um, a constant times the population, but also times how far away 
So the difference between the carrying capacity and the population. So we're taking into account the population twice and the carrying capacity once. And what we can do is we can factor out um, 1 over m basically here and get, well, factor out m and say that k is c times m and get a new equation. This one's a little more informative because it shows us that we still have a constant times the population. That's fine. But it shows us that the ratio of the population to the carrying capacity changes this number. So this is the one that's normally used, although you could use this one. It would be just fine. But this is sort of the standard formula that's used. So notice that if p is small, then this is close to zero. And so if this whole thing is zero, then this, well, I'm sorry, if this whole thing is zero, then this whole thing is one. And you get dp dt is roughly equivalent to kp. That's one of the things we wanted to do. And notice that if p is larger than m, then this is greater than one, and this thing is negative. These are both positive. Positive times positive times negative is negative, and that also gives us one of the conditions we wanted. And it turns out that we do get one more thing for free, and that is as p gets closer to m, this whole thing gets closer to zero, right? Because as this gets closer to m, as p gets closer to m, this gets closer to one. One minus a number close to one is close to zero. So it means that this whole thing gets closer and closer to zero, which slows down the population growth, whether it's positive or negative. So if the population is less than m, as, m, as p gets close to m, uh, the derivative gets close to zero. And if p is greater than m and gets close to m, this thing is also going to zero. So that's uh, three things. So we, we wanted to build a model that did these two things. And as a result, this also happens. So this is just an example of how model building happens in the real world. This is a very old model. But new differential equation models are being built all the time. In fact, differential equations is probably the number one use of calculus in the real world today. Right? Not a lot of people are finding volumes of, uh, of, of rotation, whereas um, differential equations are being solved all the time. Okay, so what we noticed in our uh, logistic model is that there were two equilibrium solutions where the population growth is zero, right? So let's go back and look at it. If the population is zero, then this whole thing is zero. That makes sense. So if you, if you have a starting population of zero, you can't make any more population. That totally makes sense. And P is not allowed to be negative. But the other thing is if P and M are equal, then this is one. And this whole thing is zero, so the, so the population increase is zero. And you can see that. They're called equilibrium solutions. And the way equilibrium solutions work is that it's just some number. It's just a y equals number. Because your solutions, when we do get around to solving these things, will look like y equals some function of x or some function of t. So this would just be a constant, right? Y equals M or Y equals zero. We're talking about the graph. And equilib equilibrium solutions are hard to find. Sometimes they're called constant solutions, but you can call it equilibrium solutions. Sometimes they're hard to find. We'll get into that as we start to solve these things a little bit later. So let's do an example. So here we have a population modeled by the differential equation. Right, and remember 1.2 was our initial population. Maybe this is measured in hundreds or thousands or millions. 
and this is M, the carrying capacity, also measured in the same units as the starting population. And you can see that the rate of change of the population with respect to time takes into account the population and how close the population gets to the carrying capacity. So we need to solve uh, parts A, B, and C. For what values of P is the population increasing? For what values is it decreasing? And what are the equilibrium solutions? You don't have to do them in this order. I'm going to go ahead and do them in this order. Uh, sometimes students like to find the equilibrium solutions first because um, you can see real clearly what they are from the equation. But I'm just going to do them in this order because this is the order the homework does them in. All right. We know the population is greater than zero. So to find where the population is increasing, so let's go back and look at it here. This is, this is positive, so we don't care about this. We need to know where this is positive because we need positive times positive to be positive, to have a positive derivative. So we want to know where this is positive. So you just solve this, right? 1 minus p over 4,500 is greater than 0. Move p over 4,500 to the other side. Multiply both sides by 4,500. Right? Pretty good stuff. Right? It just tells us that as long as the population is less than 4,500, the population will be increasing. And we know it's capped at the bottom at 0. Do not write negative infinity 4,500. Uh, it is capped at the bottom at 0. It is not allowed to be zero. This is not a closed interval. Because if P is zero, that's an equilibrium solution. So it's not in this interval. Uh, for part B, where it's decreasing, we just solve this inequality for it's decreasing. It's basically the same arithmetic that you have from up here. And you get basically the same thing, right? If P is greater than 4,500, then the... Um, then the population um, is negative, right? P prime is negative. And the equilibrium solutions, um, of course, are P equals zero and P equals 4,500. So this is really just carrying through what we already know to be true from looking at those graphs earlier, right? We can go and look at the graphs again, right? If the population is above M, the derivative is decreasing. If it's between 0 and m, it's increasing. So real easy to see from the graph. Not much to compute, uh, but I wanted to show you how to do the uh, algebra on it. All right, so in general, differential equations are equations that contain an unknown function and one or more of its derivatives. We're not going to spend any more time on mathematical modeling, but know that there are lots of models if you're interested in this sort of thing, you can flip through the ebook or through the textbook if you have a hard copy. And you can see lots and lots of examples. We're going to look at uh, just in general what different what differential equations are and what they do. And some of the terminology. So the order of a differential equation is the order of the highest derivative that occurs in the equation. So if we have y prime equals 2x plus y, this is a first order differential equation. If we have y double prime minus 2y prime plus 1 equals 0, this is a second order equation. Here we have a first order derivative. Here's a second order derivative. And notice that these are all functions of x. So y and its derivatives have to be functions of the independent variable we're only allowed to have one independent and one dependent variable at this stage for this class. As you get to other classes, it expands a little bit. And a function is a solution of a differential equation if the equation is satisfied when y equals f of x and its derivatives are substituted into the equation. So it's not as simple as solutions like we had before in algebra. In algebra, something is a solution when you just plug in the numbers. Here we're plugging in functions into our solution. So you'll see how that works. We'll do some examples. Show that the family of functions, y equals 8x plus c x to the minus 1, are all solutions of the differential equation xy prime plus y equals 16x. 
So you can see from the differential equation, we need y and we need y prime. So just like you've seen before in a lot of these examples, even in previous sections, just go ahead and compute the derivative first. All right, so y equals 8x plus cx to the minus 1, so y prime. Just take the derivative. It's just the power rule for both. Then what we do is we plug y and y prime back into the differential equation. So anywhere you see y prime, you just plug in 8 minus cx to the minus 2. Anywhere you see y, you plug in 8x plus cx to the minus 1. Then you're going to distribute. So if you have like negatives and stuff, distribute everything, make it look real nice. Also, because we're going to be doing some algebra, it's good to bring the exponents back into the denominator. A lot easier to do algebra in this form compared to this form. Right, so we have 8x minus cx over x squared. Right, so I just brought this into the denominator. And then I did x times c plus 8x plus c and then x to the minus 1. What happens here is the 8x and 8x makes a 16x. These x's cancel, so this becomes negative c over x plus c over x, it goes away. And we have 16x equals 16x. And because both sides of the equation are equal, uh, the family of functions are all. That, that shows that y is, in fact, uh, the solution set. So that is a family of solutions, just like we saw in the population problem that if that constant is allowed to vary, any number we plug in for C will give us a solution. And this happens every time in differential equations. Because this function here for different values of C covers the entire XY plane. So we just wanna know that this has some property of a derivative we're not telling it to go through any particular points. We're just talking about the slopes of, of, the, of the tangent lines, right? Because we're, we're trying to find a function who has a certain derivative. So we're not talking about individual points here. We're talking about derivatives. So that's why you can have an infinite number of solutions. So when we apply differential equations, we're usually not as interested in finding a family of solutions uh, called the general solution as we are in finding a solution that satisfies some additional requirement in many physical problems we need to find the particular solution that satisfies a condition of the form y of t zero equals y zero so what this is saying is that we want to know which of the family of solutions passes through some particular point. It's called an initial condition. And the problem of finding a solution of the differential equation that satisfies the initial condition is called an initial value problem. Usually we just shorten that to IVP. Uh, geometrically, when we impose an initial condition, we look at the family of solution curves and pick the one that passes through that particular point. And physically, this corresponds to measuring the state of a system at time t and using the solution of the initial value problem to predict the future behavior of the system. So this brings in a lot of ideas that we've talked about in this class and your previous math classes. Right? We can look at it graphically. We can look at it in terms of what is being modeled. And we can look at it abstractly as well. Okay, uh, here we go. Now we're going to actually solve this uh, equation. I'm going to show you how to get this solution in the next video. But for now, I'm just giving you the solution. So solutions to the differential equation y prime equals x plus y have the form y equals c e to the x minus x minus 1. Find the solution that passes through the point 0, 1. And then we're going to find the one that passes through the point 0, negative 1. So the way this works, this family of solutions passes through everywhere on the xy plane. We just want to narrow it down to a single curve that passes through this point 
and a different curve that passes through this point. So here's our solution. Notice we're, there's three pieces of information here, right? Y, C, and X. So when we plug in X and Y, it gives us C. So we just plug in 0, 1. And then you just solve for C. So this equation here satisfies the original differential equation of y prime equals x plus y and passes through this point. So you have a function, you have a function describing the slope, and you have a point. Three pieces of information, three unknowns. Now let's go and look at the which of this family passes through zero and negative one. Just plug in zero and negative one. Real easy, you get c equals zero, so it simplifies to this. And it's also very easy to verify that this satisfies the differential equation, right? We did that in an earlier problem. It wasn't this exact problem, but that's something you should be able to verify. It's on the homework. And you can see these are very different curves, right? This is a linear function, and this is some kind of curvy function. Turns out they look like this. At the end of the video, I'm going to show you how to make graphs like this. Um, the graphing uh, software, it's online and it's free. The one that I use is really easy to use. Um, <clears throat> and it really helps you visualize what's going on. Right? So it turns out every, um, every solution I could draw would satisfy some initial condition. You can see the point 0, 1 and 0, negative 1. These just happen to be the curves that satisfy that. And here's just a whole bunch. I just drew a whole bunch of these. Oh, <laughs> I, just, I just drew a whole bunch of these. You can see that they all pass through. So like here's the one, 0, negative 1, 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, 2, 0, 3. I just picked ones that um, pass through different y values uh, on the y-axis. And you can kind of see sort of how the curve spreads out. So the graph of solutions to initial value problems can be shown using direction fields or slope fields. I'll take, for example, the solution to the initial value problem in example 3a. So this is the one that passed through 0, 1. Right. Um, it was 2e to the x minus x minus 1. At every point along the solution curve, plugging in the values of x, y gives us, gives us the slope y prime at that point. So the differential equation is y prime equals x plus y. So all you have to do is take any point along this curve, plug in x plus y of its x and y coordinates, and it'll tell you the slope. And so it turns out that these, these solutions that pass through points are unique. They, they can't cross. And the way you draw them is we knew one point that the curve passed through, right? It passed through the point 0, 1. So we compute the slope of the tangent line and draw a short line segment with the slope. So 0, 1, 0 plus 1 is 1, so the, the slope here is 1. So I just drew a little line segment with slope 1. And what you would do is you would just continue along every point uh, and draw the whole direction field. And that's what this that's what this shows here. That if you know the starting point, it'll draw in um, solutions for you. And to draw the entire solution curve for an initial value problem, start at the given point and follow the direction field away from the point on both sides. The curve will follow the shape of the direction field without intersecting any of the line segments. Now, this is something you don't have to do by hand. That's why I'm using software. This is actually really tough to do by hand. But you just imagine that if you were traveling away from the initial condition, that it would just stay parallel to all the nearby line segments. So if you look here, if you pick any point along this curve and draw a tangent, that tangent is parallel to nearby um, uh, line segments.
right? And you can see it here too. And notice it won't intersect any of these. It can, it can touch them, but it won't intersect any of them. Like it won't cross, it won't cross them. And for a differential equation of the form y prime equals capital F x y, solutions to different initial value problems can never intersect. So I mentioned that earlier. You can kind of see it from the graph why it's probably true. Because we've already seen that when you have the general solution that has a C in it or a K, um, that, that gives you an infinite number of solutions. And as soon as you plug in X and Y, you get the constant. You know what the constant is? Those always have exactly one solution. So that should at least make this believable that the solutions are unique. All right, so what I want to show you now, um, you can read all this stuff. I just want to show you the graphing app. So if you're doing this in PowerPoint, just click on it. Okay, so this is what this web page looks like. Um, so here, dy dx is x plus y. You can set the viewing window. You can set like the, the precision. I usually just leave all this the way it is. I'm just using this to get a general idea of what's going on with the graphs. And then what you do is you just type in initial conditions. So one of the ones I did in the problem in the notes was zero one. So a solution to this differential equation that passes through zero one. And you can see how the software draws it. We did another one with negative one. Just type in negative one. And then it does this one by default. It solves the, the differential equation by default. So if you unclick that, it takes away the default. But you can always just put it back in by saying, I want the curve that passes through zero, zero. And so on and so forth. Now, you can try to plug in whatever you want here. You can try to type in negative four, for example. And it gives you a little red um, box. That tells you that there is no solution for this curve that passes through zero, negative four. It just doesn't exist. So you can't go outside of the viewing window. It just won't let you. But if you expand the viewing window, so let's change it. Negative five, five. Oop, I messed up. There we go. Negative five, five. Now, now it'll let you uh, type in all these numbers. So you can do negative four, negative three. So if you're getting an error, if you're messing around with this and getting an error, just make sure that the points that you're trying to intersect are in the viewing window. And so here's a nice family of curves, right? We've already seen a lot of these, but this is just how you draw a family of curves. Now you can pick any points you want. You don't have to pick the points on the y-axis. I just think it's easier to see it in the notes, right? It's like more obvious what's going on, right? You can kind of see how it all just spreads out. You can do this however you want. You can come over here and just start clicking on this thing. And you can just click on it and do all kinds of crazy stuff, you know? You're not going to break the software, right? So if you want to see just any old direction field, you can literally click on this as many times as you want. It just it doesn't care. And it just picks a different color each time. There you go. Turn it as an art project. Okay. So that's how you, you use this software. You guys can mess around with it. You can type in all kinds of weird, wacky stuff, like y equals x squared times y squared. I'm just going to make this one up. Right, and then you can click around in here and see all kinds of wacky stuff happens, right? So, this is free software for you to use. I'm gonna be doing a lot of graphs in the next section using this, and it's really good when you're doing the homework. If you're not sure, um, if you're approaching a problem correctly, you can go in here and just type it in, type in the initial condition, it'll draw the curves for you. I do not consider that cheating because you cannot do this stuff by hand. Um, I mean, I guess you could, but it would be torturous. So that's it for today's video. Um, let me know if you have any questions, and I'll see you guys next time. Thanks. Bye-bye.